Hi, I'm Guy Powell, and welcome to the next episode of The Backstory on Marketing. If you haven't already done so, please visit ProRelevant.com and sign up for all of these episodes and podcasts. So what is the difference between B2B and B2C marketing? Laura Patterson of Vision Edge Marketing will be helping us answer this question. I am the author of the newly released book, The Post-COVID Marketing Machine, Prepare Your Team to Win. And you can find more information on this at marketingmachine.prorelevant.com. But let me tell you a little bit about Laura Patterson. If you're looking for a practical, no-nonsense, proven approach to accelerate growth, create value, and improve performance, then you've connected with the right person. Laura Patterson is a recognized and trusted authority for enabling companies to take a customer-centric, outcome-based approach to organic growth by enabling them to use analytics, accountability, alignment, and operational excellence to attract, retain, and grow the value of customers. Today, she is at the helm of Vision Edge Marketing, founded in 1999, and is recognized as one of the pioneers in MPM, which is Marketing Performance Management. She received a patent for the Excellence Methodology, designed to connect activities investments to business results. She's published four books with the recent Fast Track Your Business, a customer-centric approach to accelerate market growth. In addition, she has won numerous awards, including Engadi's Top 30 Marketing Influencers and Top 200 Thought Leaders, Pigtail's Top 100 Influencers, and Top 20 Women to Watch in Business by the Sales Lead Management Association. Welcome, Laura. Thank you, Guy. It's really an honor to have a chance to do this program with you. Really appreciate the opportunity to uh, talk about some of the things that I'm passionate about, and I know we share that passion. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, and I don't know if it's a good thing or bad thing, but we've both been at it more than 20 years. So hopefully <laughs> <Yes>. we're good at it. <laughs> I, I'd like to think that we are. And congratulations on your new book. That's fantastic. Yeah, thank you. I really appreciate it. It's been doing pretty well. So, uh, But anyway, let's get started. So what is your backstory on marketing? How did you get into marketing? That's a great question. So I'll just start from the very beginning, but I'll try to make it short. You know those kids that ring your doorbell to sell you stuff from school so they can get some money? I was one of those kids. I sold uh, world's finest chocolate when I was in elementary school, uh, door to door to my neighborhood and other places in hopes of you know, collecting some funds for my school. And so I got a real interesting exposure to sales. And shortly thereafter, and you might remember this program, I don't know if they, uh, they don't do it the same way today, Junior Achievement. Uh, and I was in, a jun uh, in Junior Achievement for a few years and uh, I got to be really exposed to marketing and understand the art and science of crafting a value proposition and competitive differentiation. And I was hooked. Yeah, fantastic. Well, it's it's interesting because Junior Achievement, I thought it was a great program. I didn't get into it myself. I was unfortunately in the music side of things, but uh, definitely wanted to do that. So uh, good for you. And you know, it's fascinating too how uh, many of the marketers that I've been in, uh, that I've been interviewing have gotten their start in doing things like door to door selling when they were uh, when they were kids. So we must have learned something when we were growing up. Must have. And, you know, once I uh, got going in, in college and got exposed to the profession, I had the opportunity to have great mentors in the places I went to work. And I think that made a difference, too. And um, the, the wonderful thing about one of my first mentors, uh, Dwight Prade, who I do talk about sometimes in my blogs, is he was an Oxford professor and, uh, you know, former Oxford professor. And he was all about the creating customer value. And so long, this is a lot, no, this is decades ago now we're talking, <laughs> right? I had a 20 year plus corporate career. So uh, the idea of, of customer centricity was pretty much a part of my DNA from the start. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it's funny that you say that because one of the things that we put on our, uh, on our PowerPoints for introduction is always the customer or the consumer has to be in the center of everything that you do. So uh, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, to add on to that, not just everything you do, but every decision that you make, 
right? When you're running your business, for those of us like you and me, we're running our own businesses, you know, we make a lot of decisions every day. And the key thing is to make decisions that keep your customer form at the front and center of those decisions. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So there was a new report out. It's called the Best in Class Marketing Report. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Okay, well, you know, you made me think about it. Um, so we started this study in 2001. And then we just published the results of the last study in this past summer, 2022, in the Journal of Applied Marketing Analytics. It's a very, you know, it's an honor to have been published in a peer-reviewed journal when you have your work, non-academic work, you know, published. Um, we were very uh, privileged to work with UT's Jindal School up in Dallas. Um, they were our partners on this study. And uh, over the last few years, we've learned a lot about uh, best-in-class marketers. And one of the things we learned a number of years ago is a, around different types of marketing uh, personas in the area of performance management. And so those personas just quickly are value creators, uh, sales enablers, and campaign producers. We can talk a little bit more about that. But in the past few years, um, in conversations with members of the C-suite who take this study, uh, and who grade their, their marketing organizations on their ability to uh, contribute, uh, impact, and prove their value, the question became, okay, you've been telling us, doesn't matter if it's B2B or B2C. I know we're going to talk about that in a moment. doesn't matter how big we are, where we're located, if we're global or local. doesn't it matter about the budgets. Lots of things don't matter. Could you please tell us what does matter? What, <laughs> what is it that... Um, enables uh, a value creator to emerge in an organization or to thrive in an organization. So that was the focus of this uh, study, um, this past study. And what we did is we took already accepted work around leadership and culture because we kind of had a hypothesis, which, as you know, is pretty normal when you're setting out to do real uh, rigorous research is you start with a hypothesis. And we had a hypothesis that maybe it was leadership or culture that had something to do with the emergence of this of these groups. And um, we took existing work that had been already proven in the research and used that. And lo and behold, that hypothesis was proven true. It, actually, it's not leadership or culture. It is a very specific combination of leadership style and culture that uh, facilitate value creators uh, being successful uh, in an organization. And that is a, a, a culture of um, uh, and leadership style combined called stewardship and results. Um, mm -hmm. We can talk a lot more about that, but if people are interested, they can read the report, but um, we were able to answer the question and now we've been trying to help organizations figure out how to implement that. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And uh, so what are you defining as, uh, as a value creator? Okay, so that's a great question. So these three personas and in 2001, maybe only one in five marketing organizations were fell into this category of value creators and over you know, over 40% would be failing, get failing grades. So what, what are the nuances? A value creator is plays a strategic role in the business and they see themselves uh, supporting the, uh, the growth of the company and they are uh, very business, have a lot of business acumen and they focus on measures that matter to the C-suite and they're able to prove their value contribution and impact to the business because they align directly to business outcomes. And the next group, which is, has been a very large group. So this year, the value creators were have been growing and they've been steadily increasing to almost one in three, which is great. You know, we're, we're, we're so excited to see this con continuous improvement. Still only one in three. Um, the second group is what we call sales enablers. And they are marketing organizations that primarily see themselves in service to the sales team. The sales team is their customer and they're very pipeline centric. It's all about, you know, the lead generation and, uh, and qualified leads and attribution and, it, you know, all of that, everything and anything you can think about with regarding the pipeline. And I'm sure you know lots of marketing people that fall into that category. And it is a substantial group. And then the last group, which is campaign producers, Think of those folks as people who uh, operate like an internal agency and they make things, you, you know, um, I've had in my career a couple of instances where I was one of those 
you know, 1-800-MARKETING, I need a brochure. 1-800-MARKETING, I need a, a new video. 1-800-MARKETING, <laughs> I have a trade show. You know that group? Yep. That's what those folks are. And so they're very activity-oriented, and they measure their output, essentially, uh, around and their activity and their output, essentially. In, uh, so they have a lot of measures, but they can't really connect everything, uh, what, much of what they do to business results. Yeah, they're uh, uh, fair enough, and and they're more of a service provider, as you as you said, kind of an internal agency, and they are just uh, their goal is to produce stuff to help somebody else, and I do like the the definitions that you've got because I think the uh, the the value creators, and then what was this, the second one was sales enablers, sales enablers, because uh, quite a few B two B and quite a few smaller organizations. Uh, a lot of them do fall into the sales enabler category simply because, it, you know, the, the company is so sales focused. It's all about sales and marketing is kind of necessary, clearly necessary, but the sales guys are kind of the ones that really see themselves running the company and marketing is not an afterthought, but just a kind of a secondary priority for them. When in reality, it is, it is, uh, the combination of both sales and marketing that has to drive value for the company. And, and at some point, especially in the consumer side, you have uh, the marketers providing more of the value than the sales team. So uh, yeah, I really like those, uh, those definitions. One of the things that I liked when I was uh, looking through the report as well was how important it was to understand the consumer buyer journey. So tell us how you interpret that. The customer journey, um, we look at that very holistically. From the moment that you make contact with a company, you know, a customer makes contact with your company, all the way to the point where they become a member of your community and they become advocates and ambassadors uh, for your company. And there's a lot of stages in between. And every customer or consumer goes through the stages of, you know, contact, uh, consideration, consumption conversation, they all go through this, the, the series of steps. And I didn't know those aren't in any order, but they go through these six C's. And sometimes it's very, very quickly, and often is the case in a B2C situation. And sometimes it's less so in a very complex you know, decision uh, process that involves a lot of or numerous people uh, to finally get to the, to the let's make a deal, right? So, um, that that journey is it's important to understand that entire process and it might be different for different verticals if you're in a b2b world or different consumers depending on what those consumers are or even different geographies it can be very different or even different buying centers uh, and it's important to understand what the channels and touches are in along the way that will move a opportunity forward right uh, and that's how you begin to build things like attribution models and things like that is to really have a clarity around the understanding of what is of value in that journey to the customer in order to help them move to the next stage in their process. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, as we mentioned early on, how important it is to be consumer centric or customer centric, depending upon what your definition is. And, um, and then that consumer buyer journey or customer buyer journey is how you as a marketer can add value at each of the steps along the way, not only to that first touch, not only from the first touch all the way to the first purchase, but it's also that lifelong purchase that you're trying to achieve from all of your customers because you want them to continue to repurchase and repurchase. And then to your last point about uh, certainly advocacy and being part of your community to where they're telling other prospects that, hey, listen, buying something from uh, Laura Patterson and Vision Edge Marketing is going to be the, you know, the, right, uh, the right decision for you. I really appreciate how you how you frame that. And one of the things that here's a conversation I just had with a with a, a customer that I think helps crystallize this idea of the perspective from the from the customer's perspective. So the marketing team was having a conversation with the sales organization, and they're working on trying to create uh, both the lead scoring model and attribution mo uh, model, which are different, but they you know trying to tease out the nuances. And the sales team kept saying. Webinars don't really, we don't think webinars should be part of the lead scoring model. We don't think they had any value. 
right? So I'll just use that as this example. And of course, uh, uh, webinars are a channel, part of a channel. The touch point could be a webinar that is a customer testimonial, which would be a very different kind of webinar than maybe a, a uh, new product, mm. um, you know, rollout uh, uh, webinar, however that might be. So I, uh, my conversation was, you may not think it's important and you may not want to put that behavior in your lead scoring model, but if the customer thinks it's important as part of their buying journey, then it's kind of important to be sure you have that in your attribution model. So, <laughs> so, so that gave them food for thought. I mean, yeah, you, you salespeople might not think it as of value, okay? But if your customer thinks it's important to their decision, then you might want to reconsider. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And how, how true, how true. And, uh, you know, I, I always love it. Uh, I, I mean, no question about it. The sales do have their pulse on the consumer, but sometimes they miss certain aspects of the of the consumer behavior. And, and the, in our case, what we're talking about, the consumer buyer journey, that really can be very valuable as you're trying to build the, uh, the I would say, the medium or the long-term value of that lead or of that consumer segment or whatever you want to call it. And, uh, and, it, and, and I, I think I find your story to be very, very fascinating, but also very true and does reflect a lot of times the, some of the differences that go on between a sales organization and a, and a marketing organization. So uh, there was one thing in there I really liked as well. And I, and I, I hope you don't mind, I'm going to borrow it is what you call the metrics catalog. Uh, tell us what you mean by that. Okay, so value creators uh, have some tools that they are very proficient at using to help them uh, communicate their value and show their contribution to the business. And one of them is known as a metrics catalog. Another is a data inventory. So they really do have a clear understanding of their data. They know where it is, uh, where it comes from, you know, its source, how it's sourced, how it's updated, all of that kind of information. And that that data is used in various ways, as you know. And one of the ways it's used is to is in the development of measures and metrics and KPIs. And so the metrics catalog is the company's uh, uh, tool for what are the metrics they're using, how are those metrics calculated, what are the sources of data, you know, all what is the relationship of that measure to other measures, right? Uh, 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 what is the frequency that it is reviewed, all different kinds of things. And that's in their catalog. So they really do have a way of looking at their measures uh, to understand what they're using, when they're using it, how they're using it, um, its purpose. Uh, and that makes it possible for them to have a different kind of conversation, obviously, uh, with their leadership team. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, it's funny too, um, sometimes, you know, let's say you have a metrics for social media, we need to get engagement. And uh, sometimes it's the engagement can be the correct metric. But if you do marketing to affect the engagement, it doesn't necessarily mean that you added value. And so you have to be very careful as to how your marketing can drive, in my example, engagement but valuable engagement, not just engagement for engagement's sake. And I, I don't know, I'm sure you've run into situations like that where marketers go off and then drive engagement, but it's not really leading to any incremental value. And that is why metrics chains, metrics data chains are so crucial to marketers or any function. So engagement might be a valuable measure, but where in the chain is it? So to your point, it may be an important measure that has implications for another measure or metric further up, such as, you know, increasing consideration or inquiry rate or something that might be more meaningful, uh, for an example, or product adoption rate or something that's higher up and closer to the outcome, but you might need to get the engagement rate up in order to get that rate up. So it's really understanding that chain. And that's a, the, the other primary tool that value creators have is they really understand the relationship of the measures. It's not just a smorgasbord of measures that they are tracking and reporting, but uh, they are looking at those in the context of how they relate to each other and the outcome or the business result that they're trying to achieve. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thank you for that. That's pretty good. 
Um, all right, so uh, one last question on the report and then we can uh, talk about a, a handful of other topics. So what do you think is the biggest conclusion that uh, a reader should be able to take away from, uh, from the report? Well, this particular report um, was pretty focused on culture and leadership, but there were some other little valuable nuggets, uh, I would say. One is that even though their value creators are improving, there was still a growing, there was still plenty of improvement on all fronts for every marketing organization. And I don't know if you saw the co-marketing study that came out earlier this month that talked about marketing still struggling with ROI. Our report basically said, here's where the places are to improve. And so in the report, we kind of say, based on where you are, here's kind of things that you might want to do to get better at what you're doing. So while most value creators are much better at data than their uh, counterparts and understanding what data is appropriate and much better at measuring and understanding what measures are valuable and meaningful, they still need to work on dashboards, mm. for example, right? They still have better dashboards, but uh, still a long way away. Um, and they still need to work on models. So some analytic capabilities need to improve. Um, and so each group needs to get better. And some of them need to get just better at really understanding how to use data and how to get insights from their data to make better decisions with it. Yeah, yeah. All right, so you uh, you brought up the word dashboards. Um, uh, tell me, what do you see as being the uh, kind of the value proposition for a dashboard? Is it a soft value or is there a real hard ROI that, that you've seen for, for a, a, a good marketing dashboard? Okay, well, I think what's important too, before I give my my humble opinion about this um and it's an informed hum, humble opinion is to get clarity around a dashboard so dashboards are essentially a visualization of data and there can be a variety of dashboards and look, people have a lot of technology today you know the amount of martech at the hands of marketers is pretty prolific and it has substantially grown in the last 20 years that you and i have been doing this and almost all of them have a dashboard button that they, you can put, pick and click <laughs> and poop up comes a dashboard. It's not a dashboard in the sense of what we're talking about for a performance management dashboard. Those are just reports that are of the data inside in some visual, you know, visualized fashion. Um, a performance management dashboard is doing a few things for our marketing organization and there is real value in them. One, it's helping them understand, are we, achieving the commitments we set out and said we were going to achieve, right? So how close are we or how far away are we? And getting some insight as to why. And in a moment, I'll come back and give you a metaphor for that. And what do we need to do about it? So it helps facilitate decisions. It helps us understand what is and isn't working. It makes a marketing organization able to have a business conversation. There's nothing better than that, right? Who doesn't want to have a business conversation when it's time to talk about the work uh, and uh, that uh, and contribution they're making to the company, right? So it changes the conversation. So I think it's very healthy uh, to, uh, to be able to look at it and use it to make course adjustments. So um, one of, people ask me, can you give us um, a way to think about a performance management dashboard, which is just, again, a, a, a type of data model. I said, well, because a lot of them, they'll use their marketing automation system and they think they're getting a dashboard. I said, no, you're not really getting a dashboard when you click that button. What you're getting is a scorecard. And, mm. uh, and, the way, and I said, you know, think about it when you play putt-putt golf and you go and you get a scorecard for your round. And it tells you what your par should be for that hole. And if you play real golf, obviously you have even more data. And you're, you're tracking your how many strokes it took for you to get that ball in the hole. And if you're playing with friends, you're you're competing with each other. So not only are you competing with yourself for the hole, but you're competing with each other. And so you're tracking it all along the way. And you can see how many strokes it took for you to get there, right? And But it won't tell you why. It won't tell you that you hit the ball out of the, out of the little space that you're supposed to be in, right? Or that you kept missing the hole. You have absolutely no idea why. There's no information on the scorecard to help you do that. Dashboards will help you have better clarity as to why. So in a real round of golf, is the why because I never get the ball on the fairway? I'm too I'm always too short in my distance, or I just can't do putts and regulation. What are the why? 
So you get that dashboards help you understand that. And that gives you a better insight. Now that still won't help you uh, get to where like that may not give you insight onto whether or not you have a bad grip or you just have a bad, you know, form. Um, but that might help you say, you know, there, maybe I need to address my grip or my form because I have a problem getting it on the fairway, or maybe I need to change my club because I'm not getting mm. enough distance. So that would be how you would use that dashboard. And you wouldn't be able to do that on a scorecard. Well, I like your, your definition uh, there and the difference between a scorecard, which I think is what a lot of people believe is a dashboard because they you just to your point google analytics gives you a, a dashboard what they call a dashboard and uh, facebook gives you one and twitter gives you one and all these other things all these different online services give you a dashboard but they uh first of all they're very narrow they're very narrowly focused they're not broadly focused and to your point they don't kind of integrate everything in so that you can actually uh, understand what's driving your performance and start to make some business decisions and have business questions potentially even answered as to how to act uh, moving forward so that you can take the information that's being visualized in the dashboard and really connect it to the true drivers of the business. I, I really like what you're talking about there. Hope that will help the people listening too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thank you. Um, all right. So uh, thank you uh, uh, for for that, and and thank you for what's going on on the on that report. And that report is available on VisionEdgeMarketing.com, and we'll put a link in the video and in the audio as well for uh, how you can actually download that report. All right. So now let's uh, move on to the next topic. So tell us uh, what you believe are the big differences in measuring the ROI for uh, a B2B company versus a consumer company. And, and uh, we can play devil's advocate here and uh, hopefully have a, a good conversation on that. I'd like that. So again, I think we, we, let's be sure we uh, are, have terms in common. So I want to talk <laughs> a little bit about B2C and B2B for a moment. Because people, uh, I think today those are very blurred lines. So one of my jobs, I've done, I've been in and out of sales my whole career. And one of my jobs um, uh, during graduate school is I sold office supplies door to door. This is in the old days, guy. You didn't have Office Depot and Office Max and Staples. There were regional and mom and pop shops. And people actually would go to offices and look in office supply cabinets and work with the office manager or business manager and say, oh, it looks like you're short on paper or you need more legal pads and whatnot. And they take an actual physical order and bring them back, <laughs> right? Um, I, I'm, so, I'm, I'm way too young for that to know that. Oh yeah, I know, absolutely. <laughs> I'm making this up. <laughs> Me too, way too young. Anyway, the, uh, so uh, that, even though I was a business salesperson selling a to a business, um, that was really a B2C sell, all right? And so I wanted to use that as an example. So in my mind, a B2C sell is a, a situation where the buying process has very low risk. It can happen relatively quickly. It does not involve lots and lots of people. So you don't have a lot of buyer's remorse. I mean, you know, if those new pens that I recommended to the office manager weren't there to their liking, you know, it wasn't a big expense, and it wasn't going to you know, bring the office to a, a standstill, right? And she didn't have to, and it was a she back then, she didn't have to get you know, permission from someone to buy those pens, right? She just had, an, she had a, a budget for buying pens and paper, and she just did what she needed to do uh, and to keep supplies on hand. B2B, uh, and it can occur in a non-business environment, involves a consultative complex cell, usually involving multiple people in the process. So um, I, don't, I don't know if you remember buying your first home, but I remember buying my first home. And I remember that I did not buy that first home all by myself. I had parents involved and I had a, another friend involved that went with me to look at houses. And of course I had a real estate agent and I had Bunch of other people along the way that were involved in this process. Um, and so that was a closer to a B2B sell. And it took a long time. I, it wasn't like I was just standing at the checkout counter and making a decision on 
whether or not I wanted to indulge in that chocolate bar, all right? It, it was a, a complex decision and it took time. And so to me, those are the differences or the nuances. And so that also means when you're looking at ROI, you have to understand that buying journey again, because usually in a B2B sell, which has been the majority of my life, um, you're not gonna get the ROI right away, right? Um, and you're not gonna necessarily, although obviously today we do have B2C like you know, products out there, a lot of um, PLG products are very B2C in nature. You know, you click on the button, you do your trial, you click on the button and you buy, you know, it's like doing a sample in the grocery store. Yeah, that tasted pretty good, I'll buy that ice cream. Um, but the point I'm trying to make is the ROI is a little different animal. And so that is why we really talk about value, impact, and contribution for B2B, because you can be looking at those as interim measures. Are we moving the needle? How far did we move it? And what did it take for us to move that needle, even if we haven't gotten to the end deal yet? So I'll give an example. Um, I spent 14 years in the semiconductor industry and selling microcontrollers and marketing microcontrollers. And... Um, a design in of a microcontroller into an automobile is a pretty long process, right? And as a marketer, you have to be thinking about how can I tell whether I'm making a difference? And there are steps in the buying journey like uh, simulation boards and evaluation boards and, and samples and mask sets and ROM codes. So if I can connect my work to those kinds of things, I can begin to show my contribution and impact, even if it's three years before that product is actually so, right? So that's an example. Did that help clarify the difference? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, so I think, uh, and I, I like the way you you did it because um, although I may not agree necessarily with the term B2B for buying a house, but it's kind of more <laughs> the the the, <laughs> the complex sale versus the sale. You haven't met sale. my husband. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, but definitely uh, that, that concept of the, the complex sale where it's not just an individual making the purchase or an individual making the purpose purchase maybe for a family. It's uh, an individual that's maybe part of a decision team or a purchase committee or whatever your terminology is making a decision and taking into account a, a lot of different factors that, that go into it. And I do like your point about the, uh, the, the length of the sales cycle. Uh, I've used that example as well. And, uh, you know, the, sometimes a sales cycle can be five years. It, it might even be eight, eight or 10 years. And uh, it's, it, it's fascinating to see how, you know, how you, as a marketer, you need to be able to figure out how to add value at each of the steps at each of those waypoints along that uh, along that uh, that sales cycle. Exactly. And that also has implications. If you're going to be a value creator, you have to think differently about, so where are the markets that we can go and, per, and, and pursue? Which markets? Where can we get traction in a market for a new product quickly? Where can we grow share of wallet? Where can we expand our footprint inside a particular customer base? So there's all kinds of things that we can look at in terms of measures besides ROI. Yeah. Well, and, and actually, I, I like your term as well. ROI is certainly a financial term. And in the end, it is about the money. And we do have to make a profit uh, or we do have to spend the money wisely if it's a nonprofit. Uh, but in reality, though, to what your point is, is that it's uh, marketing performance measurement. And, um, and there are definitely a lot of challenges. And maybe we can talk a little bit about the challenges in a how you're defining the B2B sale or the complex sale. So what kind of challenges do marketers have in measuring their performance for a, a complex sale? Figuring out where are those points that they should be connecting to, right? Because um, you'll often... If you're in a in some organizations and you're very channel, you have a lot of par partners, right? So your your business is, goes through a lot of partners, resellers, value added resellers, uh, di distributors, whatever they might be, wholesalers. Uh, you may not have visibility to the very end, so you really do need to look at well, where do we have a way to show that we have we're moving the ball down the field, so to speak? Because that's really to your point. Our job is to move the ball down the field, you know. That's our job. And we may not actually make the touchdown um, in, in, in some businesses we might, but for the most part, we might not actually make the touchdown, which is why we 
wrote an article on LinkedIn recently about, you know, being a marketing, being a quarterback and really having, uh, you know, a passer rating, for example, or a score, because other people, the salespeople are really the receivers or running backs that are taking the ball over the touchline uh, uh, most of the time. Right. Mm, Um, Right. Right. We don't right. we don't often get to run it across the line. Now that does change again in some businesses like PLG and others, but we can get much closer, very you know, way closer to the uh stand. But then a lot of things around customer experience become pretty important in that in in that uh yeah. scenario. Yeah. Um, so let me interrupt you there. Uh just for the audience, uh can you define uh, PLG? Oh, product led growth. So those okay. are, are often uh, software applications that really require hardly any salespeople to touch it in order to sell it. So I bet I bet many of your uh, folks are very familiar with PLGs, Hootsuite, Zoom. These are all PLGs, and almost you know you you go in, you you trial it. Very intuitive. It doesn't take much to figure it out. You like it, you give them your money, and and you're rocking, right? It doesn't require IT. It doesn't require a salesperson. Uh, maybe a chat here and there, and and you're kind of on your way. Yeah, you know, one thing you brought up too is uh, is marketing uh, and sales. And I, I was going to use marketing versus sales, but I don't think that's really the right way to look at it. Um, one of the things that I think is is also critical now. Most definitions of marketing are you know don't include the selling function and the, the order taking functions, so to speak. And to your point about the PLGs and being able to order online, but in reality, kind of, if you, if you take one step up above that, so if you move up another 10,000 feet, so to speak, then, uh, then sales and marketing are basically delivering messages. So if I send out an email blast or a direct mail blast, i it goes out. Maybe I get some response. Maybe I get somebody to, you know, to hit on a chat button or something like that. And uh, the level of interaction is relatively low. But in reality, the salesperson is sending messages as well, only that his messages are very interactive, his or hers. Uh, messages are very interactive because then they can respond immediately to questions and and potentially even say a, a very similar message that might fit for one vertical and then modify it slightly for another f- vertical and modify it again for another vertical. So in that sense, you know, you have marketing and selling functions delivering messages to the marketplace. And uh, now the only difference, though, is that typically marketing doesn't take orders. So you do have a slight difference in the sales function. So when you were driving around and visiting those businesses and taking orders for legal pads and pens, you were physically taking the order. Nowadays, it's kind of interesting, even for large kinds of contracts and complex types of things, quite often they can be entered into uh, on the on the internet, you just you know you just put them into a website and you you've configured you know your hundred laptops and here's what I'm going to buy and stuff like that, and so it's kind of fascinating to see now how over time the 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 sales and marketing functions in terms of delivering messages and the quality of the messages versus potentially even the quantity of the messages and certainly the cost, and then lastly, how does that order actually get uh, get taken? Um, I don't know if you've seen that as well in, in what you're doing or if that's uh, uh, any different from what, you're, what you've seen with your clients. Well, you, 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 I have seen that. And I do think you're right. It is marketing and sales, hence my quarterback, receiver, running back metaphor. Um, tech, I think it's important to understand that the role of technology in today's buying journey, right? And that... There's, and we also know, I think it was from the conference board that X percent, I think it was like 60 something percent of the buying decision today or 50 something percent of the buying decision happens before you even talk to a salesperson. Mm. But in a complex consultative cell, eventually there is going to be that conversation. So there may be some technology things that happen before that conversation. And there may be some technology things that happen after that conversation. But sooner or later in a complex sale, someone's going to, if you're, if they're spending you know, four, five, six figure or more m- amount of money for their on, you know, then 
they want to look at somebody. <laughs> they <laughs> they want to know who they're giving their money to, or they should want to know who they're giving their money to. And so, um, uh, and especially if it's going to the level of, I'll call it risk, the level of risk, right? Because I think that has a lot to do with the, the, the process. Um, if it's something that isn't going to, you know, cause their company to either go out of business, crash, like uh, it's a relationship. And if that chip doesn't really matter and it's not going to make your, your product, you know, if you don't get it because of you have a bad deal or you chose the wrong supplier, oh, well, that's one thing. But if it means that you end up without being able to make your product and you're lying down and you're out of business and, you know, a few weeks, that's kind of a big problem. So I do think that is an important part of the process. And that is why it's in my mind, marketing sales have to be really good partners. And in the, in the old days, <laughs> before our time, <laughs> in the old <laughs> days before our time, uh, in the, in, if you were reading business books, selling was a part of marketing mm. in those books. So it was marketing was leading the charge. And we somehow got that flipped somewhere uh, in the last uh, few decades. And I do think that we need to remember the role of marketing is to find, keep, and grow the value of customers. And if we keep that in mind, that it's a, a pretty broad responsibility. Those are, We have to have big shoulders. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, and one of the things, too, is... Uh, after you kind of come up with recommendations on how to drive the business forward in marketing and, and of course, selling uh, by doing the analytics and doing the uh, doing what needs to be done to really prove what needs to take place to improve the overall effectiveness of marketing and selling. Sometimes companies have a lot of trouble acting on that. Uh, tell us what you found and uh, some of the things that you've done to get around that. I think that the most important thing that marketers can do a better job of is the plan that they create. I think it all starts with that because the plan demonstrates your alignment to the business. I don't care if you're B2B or B2C. And I find that many marketing plans, plans for all functions um, have real challenges. They're not measurable. They're not aligned to business outcomes. Um, there's all kinds of issues. So I think the number one thing is to have a really good, well-constructed plan that shows the connection between the things you're going to do and the money you're going to invest on behalf of the company or the organization and the results that the company is trying to achieve. And it's very hard to do that in some of the planning structures that we have today. That's the first and foremost thing. So getting that right, and it becomes a real, it serves as your a roadmap, right? your blueprint for what you're going to do. And if that is a starting point. Here we are on the verge of another calendar year, and people are in planning mode. And I bet you've seen this. You've never done this, but I bet you've seen this. <laughs> you need to submit your budget for next year. And so you open up an Excel worksheet. And then you open up last year's Excel worksheet. Mm -hmm. And you copy the things from the last year's Excel <laughs> worksheet. And you put it in this year's Excel worksheet. And you change some dates, maybe some events and whatnot. And maybe you take your costs up a little, you know, 10% or whatnot to uh, for inflation or whatnot. And, Maybe you know you need a couple people, so you take up your talent and you hit total. Voila, your plan, right? But that's well, that yeah, yeah, and that that plan is not a plan, and and I I talk about that a lot. That is that's a budget. That is not a that's plan. a budget, that's but a not budget. a plan. Yeah, yeah. And and people are do do that, and then they go put a plan together for their budget. Mm. Right. So in my in our point of view. You should understand what the what will be success for the business. How will success be measured for the business uh, in one year or 18 months, whatever the time horizon is? What does the leadership team expect you to do yep. to contribute to that? And how will they know you did? And if you start there, you'll be on a much better path to being able to show your value, be more effective, be more efficient, You know, understand what data you need. It, it just has numerous implications yeah absolutely it's so funny uh, that you bring that up and uh and i i spend a lot of time in in my last book about talking about you know the corporate plan the annual plan the strategic plan the tactical plan i remember when i was a, a lowly product manager you know i said oh that we gotta think strategically here and and in reality you know to me 
a strategic plan, you know, you're looking three to five years out, what, where am I going to be in three to five years? And I'm saying, well, what are we going to do strategically this weekend? <laughs> and, <laughs> totally got it wrong. But it's also interesting. I mean, you, you bring up a good point. We've got a call uh, tomorrow with the uh, CEO of, uh, uh, of a, one of our prospects. And uh, we've been doing our due diligence ahead of time and, and speaking with the various other folks that are involved in the, in the decision. And one of the things is they have a growth goal, like everybody, we all have growth goals. We all have, want to make a certain amount of whatever revenue or sales or units sold or whatever the, the right target is. And uh, what's interesting is uh, the, their, their target, based on just what we've seen so far, is there's no way they're ever going to hit it. And because we, can, we know ahead of time how effective their marketing is and what their what their plan is for how much money they want to spend on marketing and that they'll never get there. It's just not possible. And, uh, you know, and unfortunately we, as kind of the, in, in many cases, the, the, the evil accountants, we have to give them the bad news that says, uh, you know, that's a great plan. That's a really good opportunity, but uh, you're not going to be able to get there given what you think you're, you're going to try and do. And, uh, and so I really appreciate your points there. It, it makes a lot of sense in terms of the definition of a plan and the definition of a budget and stuff like that. Yeah, we just did a post on outcome-based budgeting and why you want to do that compared to doing traditional sub-account budgeting. And we've gotten some really good feedback on that. And I think if, if more functions within an organization mm. would think about the outcomes and budget that way, they would be able to have different kinds of conversations as we face what might be challenging you know, economic times this coming yep. year. I mean, we're already facing inflation. There's a lot of yep. talk about what that means. And you and I have been around long enough to know that that oftentimes results in someone coming along, whether you're in marketing or another group that says, you know, I think we're going to need to tighten the belt. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I've never and, heard that before. <laughs> no, never. <laughs> and and uh, me neither. Uh, it's always been good. It's always been a feast. No fan. <laughs> so, um, but but in the, in the situation when that does occur or could occur, um, if you have an outcome-based budget, you can really engage in a very different kind of conversation than if you do that budget with the Excel sheet. Because yeah. the, the CFO or whomever is coming along to have this, I'm here, I'm from XYZ and I'm here to help you with your budgeting. Um, in, and they say, well, you know, you need to cut your budget by 10%. Let me show you where you can do that. Yeah. That's what you end up with in that scenario. <laughs> if you have an outcome-based budget, you can have a different conversation that says, I'm, I'm a team player. I am happy to take my, my budget down. I know what we need that we need to do that. Let's talk about where we can do that. But most importantly, let's also talk about the impact that's going to have on the end result, how we're going to have to change and be real, you know, change our expectations yeah. of the end result. And yeah, I think especially... that's, speaking to, that's speaking to your conversation tomorrow. Yeah, and especially in marketing and especially in sales, uh, we we worked with a, a company and the CMO, and we had, we had done the uh, the ROI analysis and the connecting marketing activities to incremental sales, and and uh, the CEO said, "Hey, we want to cut you know five million out of your budget," and she says, "Absolutely, no problem at all. Glad to help out, but let's take twenty million out of our sales budget too because that's the impact." And he said, uh, "You know," and he basically said, "Huh." What? How do you know that? And he says, well, here's then the report and here's how it, it all connects together. And uh, and then she said, you know, and the budget acts move to the next office. <laughs> she was able to keep her budget. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yep. That's a yeah. great story. I love yeah. it. <laughs> so, yeah, well, um, Laura, thank you uh, so much. Is there anything else or is there any one uh, message that you'd like to get across before we close? I think a couple, I'll close with a couple. One is marketing is the engine of growth. And if you want to grow, you have to invest in marketing. But marketers have to be responsible for that investment and be able to show how the money that they are being entrusted with is going to help the company achieve its, its growth targets, right? Achieve growth. So it really is a partnership. So that means you need to really truly be a value creator. It's not just about more leads or more deals because you can actually sell yourself out of business. We know that, right? We've seen companies do that. Yep. 
Yep, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Laura, thank you uh, so much. And uh, uh, why don't you tell us where we can reach you and where we can get that report? Sure. So uh, I'm welcome hearing from anyone. And my email is Laura P. So first name, last initial P as in Patterson at visionedgemarketing.com. Feel free to reach out to me. If you come to the website, uh, you can uh, find the report at visionedgemarketing.com, MPM slash benchmark report. Uh, I'm sorry, dash benchmark report dash 2022 dash culture leadership value creators. So I'll, I'll, we'll make, let's make sure we get that in where they can Absolutely. see it and click on it. Uh, and we, we uh, it has been very well received and it is making people think about the culture. And I think culture has uh, been top of mind over the last couple of years, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, again, that's uh, visionedgemarketing.com. And uh, they were, we'll put the link uh, specifically in the show notes for to be able to download that report. Uh, I've, I've read through it and I really like the the breakout of the value, value creators, the sales enablers, and uh, I can't remember the last one. Campaign producers. Campaign producers. That's really a good way to, uh, to position where different marketing uh, teams are in their in their journeys as they as they try and grow the business. With that, uh, please stay tuned for many more videos in this series of the backstory on marketing. Please visit marketingmachine.prorelevant.com uh, to download the first chapter of my book and get other episodes, uh, other ec- epis- other excerpts. If I can get the word out. <laughs> <laughs> and don't forget to sign up for more episodes. And if you like this one, please give it and review it with five stars. Laura, thank you so much. And uh, thank you to the audience. My pleasure. Really appreciate being a part of the conversation. Thank you, Laura. Right. Bye-bye. 